Well, thanks for joining me on this glorious morning. This is something I don't normally do, just sit down and talk to the camera, but I feel, uh, I feel that a lot of people now are buying or building overland vehicles and camper vans. So I just want to basically go through with my experience about building, uh, building eBay. I just like to share my experience, my thoughts, and how I actually thought at the time, and basically I've, I wrote it all down, and I want to hand over some advice to yourselves. Now, at this point, I am going to say this is sort of like the the caution warning because some of you will not agree with what I say, and but 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 bearing in mind that obviously everyone's different. So we're not all the same persons. We're building vehicles for different purposes. We're going different places. So what I, what I say, what's worked for me may not necessarily work for yourselves. So the disclaimer out of the way. Uh, so let's get started then. So let's get started then. I get worried about people when they come up talking and the things, or some of the things they actually say to me. And you know, the, the, the simple things like, oh, oh, it's awesome, we want a vehicle like that. And I think if you are starting down this journey of spending a lot of money <clears throat> and you're gonna be maybe giving up five years of your life, then you don't want to go out there on impulse, buy the wrong vehicle, and then get halfway through the build and then realize, yeah, you've bought the wrong vehicle and it's not right for your purpose or fit for purpose. So what I've, I've done here is, this talk is gonna be about, hopefully, getting you the right vehicle before you actually even spend a penny. Every person's plan or idea about overlanding, the destinations, it's all different. So this, the ideas what I'm gonna put forward here may vary from person to person. With this in mind, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an example about myself and Helen when we set off on this journey in 2015. We we're both looking at the Mercedes Unimog, the 1300L, because it looks an awesome vehicle, and a very good off-road vehicle at, at that. And I think we're sort of like five, six years further down the road now, and I will say this, thankfully we didn't buy a Unimog because it would have been the wrong vehicle uh, for us at the time. So if we had gone out there and bought a Unimog, we would have now been looking at starting the, the, the old process over again and trying to find another vehicle. So certainly you don't want to be making that mistake. So I'm going to break this up into four parts. Purpose. Uh, what are you doing with the vehicle? Is it for living in full time? Is it just for going on holiday? Uh, are you going to be going off grid with the vehicle? and how many people are gonna be living or traveling in the vehicle. The destination and route, the weather conditions, the seasons, and the roads, what you're traveling. Looking for a vehicle that is fit for your needs. This includes the layout and construction, uh, work equipment, motorbikes, kayaks, and also the ability to change the vehicle over time. And then obviously this has all got to fit within a budget and then you've got to be able to afford the running costs and upkeep costs as well. 
Uh, and th this is all before we even start looking for a vehicle. So once you've worked out all these, you can start looking, you can start looking at vehicles. And I think one of the main important factors uh, of a vehicle is the carrying capacity. So as I've already mentioned about the purpose for the vehicle, uh, whether you're full-time living and also the number of people on the off-grid. So let's look at them, those first. So number of persons. Uh, if you're thinking about spending a lot of time off-grid, this is going to reflect in things like your water tanks and your waste tanks. For instance, a toilet cassette for a couple of persons, you're only going to get uh, one and two days out of toilet cassette. Uh, an old in tank, like we've got on EB here, we can go about 10 days. This is based on two persons. Uh, you can go down the route of a composting toilet. And I think they're, they are now becoming more popular. We did look at composting toilets back in 2015, 2016, and there weren't many people, especially in Europe and the UK, having composting toilets. Now they are becoming more popular. Uh, I believe most of them work on sawdust-based uh, elements, so think about storage of, of sawdust or whatever material you're going to put in there you're going to need, and you need to be able to get that material wherever you're travelling. The other alternative is a incinerator toilet. Now, if you go down the route of an incinerator, obviously it's quite costly, and you're going to be looking at maybe fitting a larger, a much larger LPG tank as well, so uh, bear that in mind. The weight on the vehicle, I'm going to give you our example. Uh, the vehicle for two persons living it full time, you're going to be adding around about 4.5 tonnes on the vehicle. Uh, that's including the motorbike, the size of the water tanks, the pots, pans, clothing, boots, and everything else. And I'll probably allow about one ton per person after that. So if, if there's gonna be uh, two adults, two children, I'll probably work out to about six, maybe six and a half ton for that, uh, for that capacity. Uh, you know, of, of persons. When we're talking about the carrying capacity of a vehicle as well, a lot of people try to keep vehicles, especially in the UK, under seven and a half tonne. A uh, little bit foolish, I'm going to say, because some of the vehicles, especially like ours here, it's capable of carrying 12 tonne or gross weight of 12 tonne. Now the suspension isn't going to start working to around about nine and a half, well, nine, nine tonnes, let, let's say. So you need weight on the vehicle to, to get the suspension working. So don't, certainly something like this, do not try to keep your vehicle under, under the seven and a half tonne. I don't think you're going to do it, especially if you're living in it full time. Uh, no, I, th I think it's it's near um, impossible. Not only that, you're going to be spending quite a lot of money on this project. Uh, excluding the vehicle, you're going to be you're going to be spending maybe sixty, seventy thousand uh, pound, and that's doing a building project like this on uh, doing it yourself, trying to use sometimes reclaim materials so you're going to be spending a lot of money on there uh, so what I'm going to say with the weight issue as well just go out there and get a qualification driving qualification so you can actually drive the vehicle legally uh, not only not only will you benefit from you've got that peace of mind you're also going to find out that uh, it's going to be educational for you as well. So it's going to teach you things about driving a vehicle of an HGV size, shall we say. So, and what's, you know, if, if you are spending 60, 70,000 pound on making a vehicle like this, what's another thousand pound 
on a on a driving lesson or a driving course it's nothing okay destination and route your vehicle is gonna have to be built to withstand the elements of weather whether it's snow rain or extreme heat and maybe the seasons as well uh, if you're passing through a country and it's the rainy season uh, you're going to be looking at needing drying space and maybe washing uh, washing space as well or a space for a washing machine uh, so certainly thinking about the the terrain or the climate that you're passing through you're going to have to cater for for that climate you don't want to get halfway down you know, a road a muddy road and it's in the rainy season and suddenly suddenly you, you're not on holiday you're on a you know a three month long survival course you don't want that to be happening which brings me on to uh, four by four vehicles military vehicles six by six vehicles uh, some of these vehicles there seems to be uh, a trend at the moment with military vehicles and off-road vehicles now an off-road vehicle doesn't always make a good overlanding vehicle and what i mean by this is i'll, I'll give you another example if i'm going to be traveling across america then why would you need a 4x4 an old school bus with plenty of room plenty of space inside would be ideal america's quite big the roads are quite big parking spaces are large so why would you go down the route of a 4x4 four four? so just bear this in mind and I, one example I always tend to use you can have the biggest badass chunkiest tired vehicle in the world and I can guarantee you that you'll go down a road and coming the other way will be just a standard bog standard road tires just a normal vehicle coming back the other way so uh, don't be fooled in thinking that you need a big ass monster of a vehicle to do overlanding you don't that said and done you're going to be looking at the length of the vehicle and the height now the length is it's all again down to personal choice uh, but bear in mind where you're thinking about traveling and certainly where you're thinking about parking the vehicle so a long vehicle would obviously give you more space inside but yet if you're thinking about spending time like in the uk north yorkshire derbyshire then driving around in something what's what's the size of a coach isn't going to be ideal if you think about spending time down in the french riviera uh, maybe going over the alps then a smaller vehicle is going to be more suited the height of the vehicle is something you you really need to think about as well uh, height of a vehicle will certainly restrict your your parking capabilities especially if you wanted to go off grid uh, i also see a, a common trend which is a little bit worrying uh, companies in the uk are building vehicles over the height of 3.5 3.6 when back in 2015 when we started the work or started looking at building eb the golden rule then was to try to keep your vehicle under 3.5 uh, this will this tends to work best all around the world uh, and I, I certainly noticed down in Italy a lot of the bridges were at an height of four meters so certainly once you get up to the four meter height it's you're going to restrict restrict where you can go uh, not only that obviously the the higher the center of gravity of your vehicle the more chance it has of falling over so your vehicle needs to be as low as possible and ideally under the height of 3.5 3.6 meters okay uh, a vehicle fit for your needs again this goes back to a lot of people wanting a vehicle and buying the wrong vehicle uh, for what they want to do with it 
you're going to need to look at the construction layout i've also mentioned about the seasons so it can be hot it can be cold so insulation may be a factor on that uh, how are you going to heat the space as well if you're going to extreme cold weathers you may need to be looking at a log burner and things things like that uh, equipment equipment uh, motorbikes you want a garage on there an internal working space are you going to be traveling with kayaks and other equipment so you're going to have to put these into your your building plans uh, if you are living on the vehicle uh, you're going to be carrying a lot more equipment than what you are if you're just going for a weekend away in your motorhome you also may need to think about changeability and adaptability on the vehicle and what I mean by this is, yes, today you may not have any hobbies, but yet two years down the line when you're traveling around the world, you may decide to take up kayaking. So it's always good to bear in mind that you may need to change your vehicle at some point to adapt a new addition. So it, it may be kids, it may be a kayak, you don't know, but always bear that in mind that you may need that flexibility to change what you're building. Budget. So, a budget is a big thing. Uh, be realistic. Uh, try to resist that cheap vehicle, that impulse buy, or even buying from your friends. They've got a great vehicle, it works for them, the vehicle may not work for you and buying that that impulse buy or that cheap vehicle may lead to you know to totally buying the wrong vehicle for yourselves costing as well obviously looking at the upkeep of the vehicle and the running costs you're gonna to have to bear that in mind now a vehicle if you've got some place to park it and you know whether it's a campsite whether it's somebody's land you're still going to have that little bit of a, a running cost uh, insurance maybe road tax maybe just even campsite fees so just bear that in mind you, you are going to have that that running cost buy cheap buy twice we've all heard this one i'm not saying there's anything wrong with buying an old caravan ripping out the the gubbins of an old caravan and then fit it into a camper it works for some people i think just bear in mind that you know the the cheaper you buy equipment the chances are it is going to fail down down the road somewhere uh, with eb we've tried to go down the marine rated side of things so like the water pumps and some of the other bits of equipment are marine rated uh, buying an old caravan and ripping it out is fine but just bear in mind with caravans and motorhomes they tend to keep things nice and lightweight so they tend to fit plastic rather than metal so obviously there's a quality uh, a quality cost there there are companies opening up in the UK now what are producing good bits of kit. So uh, there are more things on the market now for building overland vehicles and camper vans. So things are definitely getting better and much easier for yourselves. So now you can start looking for a vehicle. And I think these points, even though I've wrote these points down, you need to go over these points several times because each point leads on to another point and it's, it's a little bit of a minefield. Uh, as I'm quite sure you're aware, if, if you're doing uh, a project like this, then you'll understand what I'm saying. The make of vehicle, if we're traveling around the world, uh, you know, you've got to think about sometimes you may need that part. Now, or you may need that tire because you burst a tire or lost a tire or something like that and i think or we chose the mercedes because they have worldwide parts and worldwide shipping so maybe the make of the vehicle is something what you want to look at especially if you are planning on going around the world time scale time scale of parts and tires as well especially tires uh, if you have a, 
a unique tyre, then you know you may be waiting weeks for a replacement tyre. So just bear that in mind. Finally, 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 once you've got the vehicle built, you're going to be looking at maybe spraying your vehicle to a colour. Now, again, this is all personal choice. We went with the dark grey colour because we do like the wild camping. So we need something that if we're out in the woods, out in the fields, then it's not going to stick out as a colourful a colourful vehicle, even though the vehicle does tend to stick out. If you are crossing borders as well, you know, trying to keep away from your green colours or your camouflage, military colours, then it is adv advisable. If you're going to uh, outer climates, you may want to have a, a, a much lighter colour. Our roof is white and it's white for a reason and that's to reflect the heat. After saying that, if you are travelling across continents, uh, I can guarantee within the first two weeks you are going to start getting acclimatised to that temperature. Um, a lot of people do say, have we got air conditioning? No, we're not just going to Spain for you know, two weeks or Africa for two weeks, we're going to be there for months. So uh, you do get acclimatised. So you know, the colour of the vehicle isn't really that important. It's probably more important for crossing borders. So now you've got a, a few bullet points in mind, uh, a few things to think about. It's now when you can start looking for your vehicle. Uh, and like I said, right back at the very beginning, you know, a lot of people go out there, buy a vehicle they like or they want, what they fancy, and halfway through building it, the they find out that they've, they've bought the wrong vehicle. So I think go through all these points, pen to paper, do your measurements, do your working out, do your calculations, design a box, design a living quarter, what you're going to be happy with, what you can live in, and then look for a vehicle for that box to go on. And with that said, I'm going to leave it there and say, I hope that you've got some advice over this. Uh, please comment down below. Tell me what your thoughts are. Am I telling the right story? I'm, 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 I don't know. But until next time, thanks for watching, everybody.